Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar for today, CT SEDS Overview and a Q&A, which is being brought to you by CAS and the Connecticut State Department of Education. My name is Rosie O'Brien Boytek, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director for the Connecticut Association of Schools. We at CAS are very excited to host this webinar with CSDE to provide an update and overview of the progress related to the statewide implementation of the Connecticut Special Education Data System and answer any questions that you might have about CT SEDS. CT SEDS will be provided to school districts at no cost and will house the state's new and improved Individualized Education Program, IEP, as well as all required special education data components designed to reduce reporting requirements at the local level. The system will go live on July 1st, 2022, and will contain a variety of components and modules, including a parent portal in which parents will be able to access important documents, including their child's IEP. Before we get started, I just wanna remind you that this session will be recorded and it will be posted on the CAS website so that you can view it later and share it with your colleagues as well as your faculty and staff. Please use the chat feature as a way to stay actively engaged in the learning during the session and let us know if you have any technical issues as we will be monitoring the chat. In addition, we will be monitoring the Q&A feature and we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the session. So please be sure to ask your questions in the Q&A. Once again, we're very glad that you're joining us it's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Prophet, the Director for Special Education Programs and Instructional Design at CERC. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much, Rosie and Karen, for um, supporting this um, today's webinar. It is, as Rosie said, I'm the Director for Special Education Programs at CERC, and I'm one of the collaborative partners and Brian has become my actually my close colleague and friend because we work so closely together. And I'm so glad that he's here today to share with all of you um, principals and assistant principals and general educators around this incredible project that he's that Brian is leading us all through. He, he's engaged CERC, many stakeholders, the RESC Alliance, critical partners around all this work to roll this out. And he really wanted um, this opportunity to talk with all of you about your role as general educators and general ed leaders and the IEP said system. So my friend and colleague, Brian, it's yours. Thanks so much, Steve. And um, thank you to Cass once again. Uh, it's so great to see some familiar names in the chat and i um, so glad you could join us this afternoon. Uh, the, the format for today, we have just about an hour. So what I'd like to do is uh, I did prepare a slide deck with a few slides just to give you a high level overview of where we are with our progress regarding our statewide rollout. After that, um, we'll pause for any questions and then I'm gonna dive in a little bit deeper in more detail for some of the supports that we have put in place for schools as well as looking at the IEP document uh, with a little bit more detail. Um, Steve will be supporting in um, the facilitation of your questions. So please feel free at any point to interrupt with a question and not interrupt, but to interject with a question in the chat. And of course, we'll take those um, as we go. So I'm gonna, without further ado, I'll get started with my slideshow here again. And on behalf of the Connecticut State Department of Education, I'd like to thank you for your time and your interest in this uh, important initiative. We're very excited uh, and also very aware of the pressures that you are all under uh, with the challenges of the school year and the previous school year. So I wanted to start out by just thanking each and every one of you for all of your efforts in supporting students with disabilities across the course of the last two years um, like, like we've never experienced before. When I first came to the department, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the, um, as Steve mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the special education division director at the state going into my fifth year now at the department. Previously, I worked in local school districts as a director, assistant superintendent, um, and I was a special education teacher um, after, you know, training in, in school. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to um, 
you know, to talk about when I first came to the department, we, uh, I made an effort to go out and, and solicit input from our stakeholders. And um, specifically what came out of that, we held nearly uh, 40 sessions in, in all of the different regions and, and held some Spanish sessions as well. And we received feedback on the current IEP document, IEP template. And there was just unanimous support around improving the document. We looked at 50 other states' IEP templates, and uh, maybe not quite 50, but uh, many other states' templates. And Connecticut has a good document currently. It, you know, it's a good form. It it's, it's, has all the necessary components. It's something to be proud of for those that were involved with the development. And I think what happened over the years is more and more aspects of data collection and things got added to the document, it became cluttered. There's another process called education benefit, which uh, CERC you may be familiar with and CERC supports. And it looks at IEPs across a three year time frame to ensure continuity of supports and services for students with disabilities. It's a wonderful professional learning opportunity. Um, throughout that process, um, it's a great process, but we, it really highlights the need for a review and a revision of our flow of the document. When you look at a student's present levels of performance on the IEP, you're, you're flipping back from page four and five. Okay, now let's flip forward to the goals and see how those connections are made. So this is some of the feedback that we received in those regional sessions and again, had unanimous support to move forward. And that, that process started five years ago. We then moved to a partnership with PCG where um, public consulting group, you may be familiar with some of their previous work in the state around ReadCon initiatives. And PCG also has experience and knowledge rolling out statewide special education data systems in eight other states besides Connecticut. So through the um, acquisition process, it became clear that PCG was the right partner for Connecticut and for this initiative. So we're really thankful for their partnership and their experience in rolling out this information. The IEP that I talked about really was the foundation and the centerpiece for this initiative. And, but the system contains so much more. Um, you can see, I won't read through all of these bullets, but I just wanted to provide you a high level overview of what the value of CT SEDS will be down the line. One thing to highlight quickly is that we want to reduce local reporting and local paperwork burdens for school districts. Our special education data um, collection system right now will be obsolete in the future. This system will provide us with all the data we need for our federal reporting, which happens on an annual basis, as well as supporting our IEP process. So that's a very exciting aspect of this system. Uh, another really exciting aspect is the parent portal aspect of the system. We have a parent module. Every IEP and 504 document that's an output of this system will be translated into a parent's native language in, in the top 10 languages within the state. So uh, the, the days of a parent requesting a Spanish or a Polish document, waiting for the district, which may or may not have the resources to do so, um, and then the delay in getting that information to the parents are over. This system will be able to take documents, not only the templates, but also the text and the content within the documents translate those, print them out as an output of the system. Again, improving the meaningful relationships with families and the high quality components. So there are lots of benefits and value. I do wanna emphasize the fact that this does not mean that there is not a role in the future for data managers and special education secretaries. Those structures in those roles are so critical as you know, and will continue to be just in a little bit of a different way moving forward. So we're excited to progress and move forward with those um, aspects of the system. Uh, so as I mentioned, the IEP was the sort of the central focus, but we have our required data collections will also be housed within the system. 
And, and you can see some of the other areas as well of our data collection around restraint and seclusion, for example. Um, and we will have our due process activities, all one-stop shopping, if you will. So um, I do wanna highlight in some questions that we do receive as well is that the section 504 module is a piece of the system as well. As you know now, we do not, as the State Department, have a template that's required for districts in 504. That will change within this system. There will be a statewide 504 accommodation plan that is incorporated within this system. And we have, uh, we're excited to have 20 plus districts pilot that 504 component um, the next month in March, starting in March. There are new, no new requirements around Section 504, or for that matter, the IEP, but the process will be new and the document output will be different. And that Section 504 accommodation plan will have alignment with the IEP in the way that it's structured. But of course, it's a much less complex system than the IEP. So the learning curve will um, obviously be lessened as well for that piece. I did wanna highlight just briefly that we, the system also will contain an MTSS, SRBI, RTI, pick your acronym uh, module that will help support general education interventions, universal screenings. Uh, we know the current vendor in place has that in place. Um, that will be rolled out on July 1, 2023. So that'll be a year out from our overall implementation. So just very high level, again, to make sure that we're all on the same page, the builds, we've been in process with PCG um, since late, two, um, late 2019, early 2020, where we began to build the system. This year, we're piloting the system, which I'll talk a little bit more about and then we have statewide implementation in 22-23. After our, my slide deck, which I just have a couple more slides and then we'll open it up to questions, I wanted to show you our web page, which highlights important information, frequently asked questions, and we have some recorded resources for you on that page as well. So I just wanted to provide you with a direct link because I know sometimes our website can be difficult to navigate. The pilot. So we are really excited and um, reviewing on a daily basis now feedback that we're receiving from our 20 pilot school districts on the IEP module and the referral and the evaluation module. Uh, the, the pilot is not uh, a concurrent system with the current vendor. It is a, a site that is uh, that contains data that is actual real student data from the district, but will not be saved. It will not be carried on through the launch. It's just a sandbox to test the system to uh, ensure that we're getting feedback on the system's user experience, the rules of completion that we put in place, and the continuity of the process. So We've been, we have surveys for our pilot districts that they're completing, giving back that information to us. And, and we have the ability to make tweaks, make improvements so that that product is the best product that it can be to support the, the processes that we have in place starting on July 1. If you're interested, this is a list of the districts that have been cooperating and participating in those pilot sessions. So <clears throat> training. I wanted to speak a little bit about support and training, and uh, there are two main components of how we're supporting this initiative. One is called IEP quality training, which we rolled out for our pilot districts before they engaged in their pilot earlier this school year. This is a um, really wonderful foundation of information around the special education process and it contains information from early childhood all the way until a student's exit from special education, whether that be by acquiring a regular high school diploma or aging out at the, at the, day, the, uh, the day before a student turns 22. So these, all of these resources are housed within Canvas. There are asynchronous and synchronous modules. This is a visual here to show you a little bit about the topics 
within these sessions. We have amazing trainers um, through the Rusk Alliance and through CERC to support this work. Our pilot districts gave us great feedback on this training where they sent core groups of individuals to access this training. We took that feedback again to make improvements. And as of January, these sessions have been available regionally to the state, which sold out as you can imagine very quickly. I do wanna emphasize these training modules do not train you or prepare you for the system itself. It is not how to use or navigate the system. What this does, however, is to, as I said, create a foundation for a quality output for special education, as well as to give previews and snapshots of the context of the system. So we do want to, uh, you know, address that expectation that this training is not going into the system using it uh, and testing it. It is on the content aspects of the system. The second aspect, of course, is the navigation and the user training. Again, PCG's had a significant amount of experience in rolling this out statewide. Um, and so the model that we have in place is to train what we're calling expert trainers or expert users over the summer months. Each district's been allocated a certain number of slots so that it, uh, roughly two individuals per school building within the district. If you're a small district with one building, you would have two, at least two trainers. If you're a much larger district with multiple buildings, um, you would have obviously more trainers, uh, roughly two per building. Those individuals would have access to navigation training. They would also be given resources, including the user guide and some recorded webinars to share with staff within their buildings to support their new learning in this system. Again, I have to, um, I have to say, we understand how challenging this change will be in that it's not only learning a new form or a new, uh, a new process, it's also understanding and learning the technology and how to navigate that process very well. So we are aware of that, which is why we've taken the time to put additional supports in place through the REST Alliance, through CERC, in addition to PCG, to support that training. Uh, we also have other opportunities for support, which I will describe in a, in a few minutes. So um, the data migration process, we get a lot of questions about that. You know, how is that gonna work with the current system that we have? Because it's a new form and a new template, we are taking static documents. There isn't a way to directly migrate the data from your current system into the new system because we have new documents and forms. So um, one thing that we took real care in designing in this system is the fact that we didn't want a data system, we didn't want a data entry system where you're just completing a form or you're just going in to do a document. We really designed it in a manner that is a process. So because of that, and because of the new templates for both 504 and IEP, we're working with Frontline and PowerSchool directly to download all static documents as PDFs within the current system, give them to you with the naming conventions that are required and necessary for that to upload into the new system. There also is one source of truth for this new system, which is called our PSIS information. And this, that will be the one source of truth. So when the flip switch is flipped on July 1, 2022, all of your student information, um, all students with IEPs will be in the system. All the demographic information will be in there that we have from the PSIS system to be able to provide a foundation. And this is a slow rollout. We're not asking districts and schools and case managers to take the old IEP and then to put the new, put it, put the student's information into the new format. As students have planning and placement team meetings throughout the year, then and only then will that student have a new document. So we know the system will not have a full complement of new IEPs until one full year of use within the system. 
Because of the process-based navigation of this system, we also know that it's gonna take time and the best training that I, which I've been promoting is to just use the system. The first time that you go in is challenging and can be frustrating. The second time is easier. And the third time and the more and more that you're in it, what used to be frustrating now becomes secondhand knowledge because we're learning a, a new process and a new system to navigate. So um, that is the overview of the data migration. Happy to answer any questions about that. Just one more slide, which I wanna um, highlight, is that I mentioned SRBI and RTI. There are, the districts are making decisions now about keeping contracts with their local vendor for uh, a few different reasons. One reason would be that you're accessing their RTI or SRBI system. As I mentioned earlier, that will not be a, a, a live ready component of our system until the first year, after the first year, July 1, 2023. For students that require progress reports and IEPs, that's another reason why a district may keep the current system in place for continuity and understanding of your staff. There is a, uh, a, an interactive progress reporting feature in CT SEDS once a student has a new IEP to be able to write progress reports on. There is also an option that is at no cost to districts in the new system, which is just a template, um, which would require entry of information for the goals and objectives, and then uh, a demonstration of what that student's progress is towards those goals. So those are two reasons. And then the final is an amendment. So as you know, or probably are aware, that a, a change to a student's IEP can take place if the parent and the school district agree that a planning and placement team is not necessary. That's called an amendment. That can't happen in the new system, again, until you have a new IEP in the system to amend. So that can either be done as a, a template and uploaded into the new system or for continuity. Um, and if districts were interested, they can keep their current system to do that action and to do that activity. So I know that was a lot of information, uh, again, very high level information, but Steve, I'm not sure if there are either hands raised or questions in the chat that I can take now, and then um, I'll transition to a little bit more information that's contained on our website. Yeah. All right. So we just have a few comments and a question. So number one, I dropped in the new IEP um, link into the chat for the new IEP CT said on the State Department Ed website. Excellent. I dropped the, the draft of the new IEP template for you to review as well as the crosswalk between mm -hmm. the current IEP and the new IEP that goes into effect on July 1st. So that's a great document. All right, just when you're talking about my data migration, there's a comment that, um, that, that Districts, do they pay for that migration of SIS information one or two ways? Yeah, so there's, um, I can clarify, Steve. So the document migration process that we're asking Frontline and Power School to do where the static documents in your current system are exported. Um, sorry, yeah, they're, they're exported, yes. <laughs> I used the right term. Out of, the, out of the previous system, given to you in the format that you need, and then uploaded or imported into the new system on July 1, that's being provided at no cost to districts. So the State Department is working with Frontline directly and PowerSchool to be able to do those activities. Um, I think what was being asked too is a different question around the student information sync. So many of you have what's called Centris Sync, I believe now with Frontline, and I think PowerSchool may have an equivalent in that. Um, that is a cost to districts. If they're interested in doing that and working with PCG directly, it's taking your current student information system, whether that's PowerSchool, Aspen, or some other product, and ensuring that there's a sync of information flowing into and out of the system in, in that way. PCG has details and information on that. The point of contact for that conversation is Pete Marshall. 
And if districts are interested in that, there's a $1,500 per year cost for one-way flow of information and a $2,000 total cost if the information flows back and forth between the system. So the, the, I hope that answered that question. And then there was one about the September transfer meeting for new students moving into district or magnet schools. Will they yeah. need to have the whole IEP written anew because the only parts that are populated in the, in the system right now are the demographics? That's correct. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we, we do get that question quite frequently in that once you have any new activity or new action in the system is an opportunity to, to do a new IEP. But let's say that you convene and it's just to review a transition and there's no changes at all to the current IEP. We have something in the system called a record of meeting where you can send out a PPT notice, document the summary of that meeting. But if there are really no substantive changes to that document, then there isn't a need to, to create a whole new IEP for that. So really we're talking about that student's first annual review or any significant revisions to the IEP document itself. And we're hoping that other changes to the IEP can be handled through amendments. Mm -hmm. um, a question about the amendments is for, so for an amendment, can they, can, can districts continue to use IEP director frontline and upload yes. the paperwork to CT said? Yeah. Yes. Um, and then there's one, the parent portal, will yes. parents have the opportunity to see IEPs in draft? And will, no. the, will the system have the capability to translate other documents such as evaluations and invites? Invites, yes, evaluations, no. And let me explain why. So any document that's generated in the system will be translated and is translatable. But if your school psychologist goes off and writes a report and an eval on the, on the WISC, let's say, or some other evaluation that they're doing, and then they go to upload that as a PDF into the, into the system, that document itself would not be translated. Steve, what was the first part of that question? Will parents be able the, to see the IEP yes, draft? Yes. Right, so the parent portal is, the parent will only see what's sent to them in the parent portal. Right. So they don't see the workspace or anything that's in draft. You could send a draft if your team's worked on an IEP and it's in draft format and you wanna send that to the parent five days before the meeting or, or you know, to give them a preview of what the team's thinking is around the draft IEP, that can't happen, but the parent cannot see anything in the system unless it's sent directly to them. A real nice feature in the system is that they can sign consent documents, eval consents, uh, IEP, um, consent for special education, provision of services, and so forth, right in the system electronically. And it's compatible with a, a smartphone, uh, an iPad, any, any type of lap, laptop. So any type of technology that the parent has, they can access the system. And it's a one-time code, which is also a great feature in that they don't have to remember a username or password. They get a one-time code, click on that, access it. They can see what they need to see and then download what's needed. All right, there's a question about which we, which, um, will there be additional content of IEP quality trainings opening up because, um, and we and I can answer, yes, we'll be continuing to provide opportunities for um, district staff members to receive IEP quality training through those eight modules. Yes, and thank you, thank you for that question because what I forgot to mention in my slides is that the IEP quality training, there was there was a lot of anxiety initially to uh, from our educators to to access those training before July one, you, we, we need to access those training. I want to emphasize that it is not required to um, to be able to start using the system. It is a great foundation and, and it's a, a recommendation to to access that training, but it's not required. Staff that doesn't access IEP training will still receive supports and information on how to navigate that new system. And Steve, as you know, that this is a five-year strategic right. rollout in that, as Steve mentioned, more offerings will be made in the summer, next fall, 
the spring after that, the summer after, continuously for the next five years. As you get new staff into your building, there'll be opportunities and or, um, so it's, that's why we asked districts initially to, to train a core group within your team so you have that you know, uh, cross-departmental um, perspective in, in accessing that training. Mm -hmm. Steve, while we're on the training topic, I, I just want to share my screen again, and then we can go back to more questions. Yeah. But I did want to share this document, which I think you will be able to put in the chat as well, uh, which is our, our um, IEP preview sessions. So sorry, it's taking me a couple of clicks here. Steve, is that coming through okay? Yeah, I'll drop it in the chat. Mm -hmm. So a question that we get pretty frequently is, well, the CT, you know, expert training, CT sets user expert training sessions are, that's all great, but um, what if we have PPT meetings, you know, before the expert trainers are trained? Or, you know, how do we more broadly expose our staff to the new system? We've designed in collaboration with CERC and the, uh, our partners at PCG, I, IEP preview sessions. So every Monday between March 7th and the end of May, we're gonna be holding our sessions. They'll be recorded and the, our presentation piece will be short, 20 minutes, 25 minutes at the most. And then we'll be opening it up to questions and uh, comments and concerns. And the purpose of these rollout preview sessions is to talk about what the old document or form looked like, what the new document form contains and highlight those really important aspects of that. And then to show screenshots in the context of how the system is going to support that change within the new process. So it's not a formal training, but it's a way to, expo you know, to get exposure and to understand and take out some of the mystery out of the, the newness or the unknown. So we're really excited for CERC support in these, in these sessions, as well as uh, team members from the Bureau of Special Education who will be highlighting different aspects of this training. These are open to all educators. And again, if you can't join in on a Monday afternoon, we know that's a day that many of you have your leadership meetings or central office meetings. They will be recorded and posted on website for later view. All right, just a few more questions, Brian. Um, number one, will there be um, a system in place for districts and APSEPs, you know, our private, yes. private to be able to build IEPs collaboratively? Yeah, that, this is another component of the system that we're very excited about. Um, what, what we heard from APSEPs and our partners um, that have out of district program placements is that in, they, the, in the current system, they had individual contracts with the vendor so that they could access their students in, in a way that they could run reports and so forth. And we know that students can be shared with, uh, within the current vendor system too. The CT set system is different in the sense that the, the student's workspace will be shared. So the district that's responsible, which we're gonna call the OSEP district, the district that's responsible for the IEP and the IEP implementation, that sending school, sending town district, will have the student's records as would that approved private special education program or out of district program. So they would be collectively able to share that information and share that space. But as far as a permissions level, some of the requirements would only be accessible from the school district that is responsible for that student. So um, it's, a, it's a shared virtual drawer, if you will, for that student, which not only helps with out of district placements, but helps when students transition from one district to the next, one school to the next, that information and process flow will be seamless once that school is identified and, and shared. So um, we're looking forward to testing that aspect of the system and hearing back from our pilot districts to ensure that it's a, a process that is convenient and efficient. Um, another question is from, you know, will the, the demographic information about the students, you know, their yeah. name, SASET ID, date of birth, that'll be yep. carried over every year. Um, That's right. As you build, as 
It also populates all of the forms, Steve. So every form that that student is on will be pre-populated and will not be a data entry point. The system intuitively pulls that data where needed and pre-populates all of the forms. Mm -hmm. How will the parents learn about the system and gain information on how to access it? Great question. So we have um, partnered with CPAC, our parent training information center in the state. And they've actually already rolled out a pilot of three sessions of IEP overview. CPAC has been supporting IEP information for parents for a number of years. And all they've done is just shifted that information and content so that parents understand the new form and the new document. So we've done overview sessions like this with CPAC, with our SEPTOs, which are special education parent teacher organizations. I've been meeting with parent advocacy groups and just really everywhere I can to uh, help parents understand what's coming down the road in that first PPT so that there um, isn't a great shock of that the form is gonna look different, the template, the output, um, and it's gonna be easier to understand, it's gonna be easier to read, um, and the flow we feel will be much improved, but it will be a different document. So all of the resources that CPAC has in place on the current document have been revised and revamped to reflect this new. And one of the things that I can share too, Steve, and this is in draft format, but I'm happy to share it with you is a resource. I know you're gonna put a resource in the chat if you haven't already, which is a side-by-side -side crosswalk. Yeah, did that. Mm -hmm. We're also work, so the content in the crosswalk, as you can see, it's taking the current IEP pages and comparing it to the new IEP sections. And then we have visuals to go along with that. Our communications department right now is working to make sure that these are 508 compliant because of the fact that we are using photos, but that's gonna be a real great one page resource for your teachers, administrators, building level administrators um, in the future. And Steve, I know you were, um, you said you put that crosswalk in the mm -hmm. chat. This is the crosswalk that is in place right now and currently accessible. So we're just gonna take this content and add photos to it to even enhance it more. But you can see here what, you know, what's new, what's different overall. One is what you heard me say is speaking about IEP sections instead of pages. So we're really excited about that, the language trans translation. Um, in the related services, you, we really built in the process to incorporate general education input in the, in the development of goals and objectives, present levels of performance, as well as our service delivery. So we, we're also excited about those changes, but understand that it's gonna take time and it's gonna take effort to learn, again, the new process and, and how to navigate. But um, there's quite a bit of enhancements that were, will result in higher quality documents. So we will share these resources with you to make sure that you have wonderful, you know, quick, easy, what's new, what's different. And I, I, we've heard really positive feedback that these documents take the edge off a little bit of the anxiety of, of the unknown. So we're gonna to continue to promote those resources and share them. And I also think our recorded IEP preview sessions will help quite a bit too, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, will birth to three referred students be pre-populated with SAS at IDs? So that's a data question that mm -hmm. I don't wanna mess up. <laughs> We do have a process in place for that. Um, I just can't speak very articulately to it right now, but there, there is a process for birth to three um, that is different than what happens right now with our CDAC in, in um, assigning those student SASID numbers. But we work very closely with the Office for Early Childhood, our early childhood coordinator, Andrea Brunell, and um, ensured that that process will flow uh, in a much easier and succinct way than the current system. Will there be similar trainings? Like I'm thinking IEP quality trainings for, yep. the, for staff that write 504 plans. 
So that's a great question. So we have the 504 pilot districts working with us next month and giving us feedback as we roll out that system. We currently do not have a 504 quality equivalent to the IEP training, but we are looking at different ways to be able to do so. The 504 process is much less complex and there are many, uh, there are much fewer requirements around that but this is something that the State Department would be open and willing to um, in hearing from the field, the importance of this. So um, not as of the moment for the 504 quality series, but it's certainly something that our pilot districts are gonna help us inform uh, because the second aspect of the, you know, the first aspect of the feedback we receive from our pilot districts is how to um, improve the system. The second aspect is really highlighting where training and support are needed. Mm -hmm. So if this is a section where there was some confusion, that helps us understand that more training and support is needed in that area. So we're really looking forward to the next month on the 504 feedback. Will there be a space on the IEP to identify a student as an identified English learner? Yes. And if so, will there be data included on the IEP about their in their EL program and language development? Not, no, there are no new, that we did, if it's not an IEP requirement, it's not in the system, but there is that connection behind the system, if you will. I can give you another example. If a student has a health plan, that's not part of a, a 504 necessarily or an IEP, but there's an ability for to trigger the system to say, yes, Johnny has a health plan, you know, and, and here it is, you know, you can upload that plan is in. Similarly with an English learner, if they have an English learner plan that can be uploaded into the system and indicated. We have talked about incorporating an EL module within this as well. It's not something that was in the original RFP or it hasn't been built, but I think there's a lot of potential for English learners within this system. So Whoever asked that question, or if there's other individuals that are interested in that, uh, we can create a feedback loop for us to, to help inform us about how the system can help support requirements around English learners. Um, there's a I think the final question I'm trying to make sure I get is why was dominant language taken off? I'm not, I think that was the question. So, there, so for <clears throat> the dominant language that may be referring to what was previously on page one of the IEP and now it's section one of the IEP. Again, the language of the student is built in inherently into the system. So we get that information you know, through PSIS and information that's already being collected. If that student is a Spanish speaking student or that is a the family members, a parent is a Spanish speaking student, the default for all of the documents will be in Spanish. So it, it takes that aspect out of the, the need, again, to uh, articulate it the way we did in the previous system. So I, I hope that's answering the question uh, um, accurately, but, or, or I'm interpreting that question accurately, but the, there are mechanisms built behind the form that we don't need to overly clutter the form with. Uh, but that's that's feedback. Again, we're receiving feedback from districts about, you know, we feel this is important to have or that. And so what we roll out in July can always be updated, improved over the years, and we'll continue to do that. I don't want you to think that it's, um, you know, in uh, um, uh, inconceivable to, to update the document um, over the course of time. One's, one's more of a comment. One of the some of the participants are already in are in pilot districts who are actually trying out the new system. Yeah. And and you know they've been hearing that it's taking quite a you know chunk of time to create this IEP. Um, yes. And you know how how long will it take to create an IEP as we move forward with this system? Yeah, I think um, and when this goes back Steve what I would say earlier is that the more you use the system, the quicker you'll become and the more adept in, in that you will become in creating a, an IEP document. 
we do get a lot of questions about, you know, um, can there be more drop downs added or, you know, what happened to this aspect? And uh, we're, we're taking in all that feedback. The, the process is not designed to, you know, to take longer, but it is designed to be a high quality process that it is thoughtful and individualized. So that, that was our goal. And so I, I would say confidently, it will take a longer time to create an IEP um, on Jul after July 1 than it did before June 30th for your first IEP, second IEP. As you get more IEPs under your experience, under your belt, so to speak, it will become, again, secondhand nature. I think the first six months will be challenging for, um, for everyone, which is why we're, we're um, rolling out the supports that we are and understand, again, the challenges and the timing of this. We know schools are facing uh, challenges related to the pandemic, the ever-changing information around masking requirements and mitigation strategies, as well as staffing shortages and, and a number of issues and that we are empathetic to and understand that um, even in under ideal circumstances that how you know, this shift um, is, is uh, you know, change is hard for us all. Uh, I do believe that once we come out of that initial change period and we start to turn the corner and become familiar with the navigation, understand the process and how it's a collaborative process. I think one of the things, Steve, is that in the pilot, when you think about an evaluation, it's a, it's a two month process, a 60 day process from referral uh, to IEP implementation. We're asking our pilot districts to do that over the course of a couple hours, which is really challenging. So, you know, going into the system to do one step and then coming back out and going into the system to do the next step will be a very different experience than trying to understand the whole piece. But it's a it's a it's a learning curve for sure, and um, we are aware of that, and which is why we're putting you know the the resources and supports in place that we can to the extent we can. I did see a question in the chat, Steve, about the LRE document, which is the least restrictive environment checklist. And that is built into the system as a, as a, mo a, mo a module. Um, so in other words, as you answer the LRE questions, it's the document will shrink or expand as needed. And uh, again, the entire IEP is adaptive in that way. When you work through special considerations for a student, is this a student that requires support around behavior? Yes or yes or no. If yes, are those behavior needs met with a with goals and objectives or a behavior intervention plan? As you click that, the system will then expect to see the outcome or the follow up from that. Similarly, the LRE checklist. As you answer questions, the document will expand or condense, and then populate and print out upon completion. Uh, just uh, um, the RESC and CERT trainers also, I just wanted to add a little bit to Brian. We're also now in the process of observing the pilot districts actually yep. navigating and working in the system, which yeah. has been great for us. And as we, so there, there's a number, like four to five different sessions that they engage in. We're seeing that they're already feeling more comfortable because of the repetition and the practice. But you, what you'll see too is the IEP quality training, some of the decision-making strategies around creating your present levels of performance pages, how to identify the critical standard that's going to align with the goals and objectives that you develop. You'll see it, it's really kind of embedded in the system. So when your team when your case managers start developing their IPs in the system, they're gonna be referring to a lot of those decision types of strategies we've, they've learned in the IEP quality training. Um, there was a question about, will the system flag those areas of the IEP that are incomplete prior to finalization? The current yes. system will not, oh, will not let you finalize until you, oh yes, you'll see. <laughs> yes. And, and Steve, what I would say is this too, and I'll share that a lot of our school, our pilot districts have given us feedback on this. 
that there is a list, but um, wouldn't it be nice if it would take us to the exact point in the system? Or wouldn't it be nice if it intuitively kind of went to those sections? Uh, because again, it's a process different than, than what the current system is. So those are feedback that are very important to us and that we're gonna incorporate you know, before rollout to the extent that we can before July 1. But uh, just as an example, so you're probably familiar with the transition requirements, secondary transition requirements for students. This system will not let a finalized IEP happen if there are any compliance issues with transition. It's just built in as rules of completion. So if your staff inadvertently forgot to enter information around a transition assessment, around inviting a student to a PPT, all of those flags come up. So we really do expect as far as a compliance issue to have little, none, <laughs> really no errors in, in transition um, or aspects of, of the pieces in, in the IEP. Now, of course, compliance is one thing, but quality is another, which is the importance of the training that CERC and the REST Alliance are supporting for quality IEPs. Just a few, um... Quick questions about alerts. Will there be alerts when final when dates are put in incorrect for the next annual or try or reevaluations? Yes, yeah. the um, we have designed the system so that dates are pre-populated, so that takes away any type of human error. If you know, if you type a one instead of a two, or things like that, we really took away any possibilities of human error to the extent that we could. Uh, we also want to balance that with giving districts flexibility where needed. So we really try to do that to the best extent that we could. We expect these conversations to continue on, Steve, you know, across multiple years as districts become more and more familiar. And I see a real opportunity after the first year to, again, make enhancements and improvements to the system. Uh, based on a full year's worth of work. There's a question, do you have a copy or sample of the IEP at a glance that will be available through our student data management system, i.e. PowerSchool? Um, That's I the student information sync that they're referring to, Steve. So right yeah. now in PowerSchool, the teacher will see that a student has an IEP or they'll have an IEP at a glance that they can look at accommodations, for example. The system would have, will have an IEP at a glance um, and that student information sync can happen. There is an additional cost to that, that, that the districts would, it would either be 1500 for one way or $2,000 for uh, flow back and forth. Okay. There's a good comment in here. It would be great to have a think group of sorts with the pilot district to help brainstorm strategic actions or best practices to support a strategic training system and to build capacity over time at the district level. Yeah, so our pilot districts are doing surveys, but we're also gonna do focus groups with them. And then we're gonna bring in, um, you know, we've already heard from Concase, for example, and wouldn't it be great if we could shadow or observe the pilot districts as they're in the system. And we're gonna provide similar types of structures, not necessarily shadowing the pilot districts, but there will be absolutely be opportunities for feedback and then sharing that uh, best practice. So for non-pilot districts, there will certainly be opportunities for feedback. And as we're winding down, we, we still have five minutes left for our session, but I just wanted to thank Cass once again for the opportunity to, to talk about this really important initiative and Please, you know, I know there were a couple of questions about the amount of time and some folks that are in, in the pilots that um, have questions and have concerns. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us and share either the, through the structures that we have in place, or you can contact Steve, myself, um, our team at PCG, and uh, let us know your concerns, let us know your questions, let us know your suggestions, and we will do everything that we can to support you. Okay, I think I covered, I think we were able to get all the questions. Well, there's one I just missed about, I think it was similar to APSA, but as far as um, magnet schools too. Yes. You know, the, the, yeah, the, any type of choice program will fall kind of into that category that I was speaking about, Steve. And we, we really 
um, designed the system to be an enhancement of what's currently in place for notifying both the sending school district and that receiving school of when the student begins that program, having automatic access to that student's records um, and workspace. So um, more information to come on that, but we do the expert training, all of our magnet schools, charter schools in approved private special education programs will receive that training as well. And there'll be some um, additional resources because we know those nuances are confusing and complex at times. So, so there'll be some specific training and resources for students that enter choice programs. But the, the days of either sharing a username and a password with those schools are, are over. It's, it's complete access to the students that are in that setting for uh, continuity of support. And just one final comment for our bigger districts, such as you know, our priority districts, and is we've trained a cadre of district facilitators from those districts, such as Waterbury, Bridgeport, New Haven, and CERC is supporting all of those um, facilitators. So right now, like for example, one of our big districts is running four cohorts. Each cohort is about 50 participants. We usually have about 50 participants in a, in a um, training. So we're training a lot of people in the big districts with our, with our with CERC support, supporting the, the district facilitators who've been trained in these IEP modules to, to roll out to their um, special educators, related service staff members around the IEP quality training. All right. Steve, thanks so much for facilitating the chat. Yeah. Really appreciate it. No problem. And, and for all of your support and your team support in the initiative. Uh, Rosie and Karen, thank you again for the invitation. It was uh, my pleasure. And uh, I'm very happy to do this as we get closer to the launch date. If you feel that would be valuable a little bit later in the spring, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, as things get uh, closer. And I, I know another transition we have is going from 70 degree weather yesterday to 10 inches of snow tomorrow. <laughs> Unless you're along the shore, I guess our colleagues along the shore are gonna get a little less, but that's New England. Now, I just wanna say thank you, Brian. Thank you, Stephen. I think we will take you up on this because I know that this is one of our most popular uh, webinars that we've done so far. Uh, we had a huge amount of people here. And I know that as we get closer, especially to next year when this does roll yeah. out, we're yeah. gonna have even more interest in getting questions answered from both of you. So thank you so much for bringing this to us and for sharing it with us. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone who joined us. And just a reminder that we will be posting this on the CAST website. And so you can share it with your faculty, staff, or go back and listen to some of the questions and answers again in case you missed something. So again, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Brian. And everyone stay safe, stay warm. And if you're a snowbird, enjoy it. And if not, you might want to fly south. <laughs> thank you all. Have thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks for all your support.